So for their benefit, we have to regiment their minds the way an army regiments their bodies, uh, ensure that they're under control, make it very clear that they don't participate in workplace management, and certainly not in the political arena. They're to be outside somewhere. Uh, and the dedication with which, with which mm -hmm. this task has been pursued is pretty awesome. Uh, uh, if you, I mean, just to take a, right after the fall of the House of Labor in the 1920s, when American labor really was smashed, and people were privatized and tried to accommodate individually to a most undemocratic America, as Montgomery and others have pointed out. Uh, uh, at th that was a time when there was great uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, awe about the end of history and the utopia of the masters, and it's all over, you know, us good guys have won, everybody else is at our feet, uh, kind of like some of the stuff you read today. Uh, and it sort of looked like that, you know, it's pretty much looked that way. Well, a few years later, as you know, the whole thing collapsed. And uh, there was militant working class struggle and all sorts of other popular activism, and there had to be an accommodation. You know, there had to be some kind of accommodation to the to these uh, unwashed masses who were getting out of line, uh, you know, sit down strikes and all sorts of things. And there was indeed there was this fragile social compact that uh, uh, Doug Fraser referred to was indeed established. It wasn't any gift, you know, it was won by struggle. Uh, and the, uh, meaning the labor laws and the limited social system. In fact, American workers back in the 1930s began to get the rights that had been standard long before, even in much more brutal societies. You read the right-wing British press over the, say, early part of this century, they can't believe how bad American workers are treated. You know? uh, the same was true of visitors from Australia and so on. By the 1930s, the U.S. was sort of brought into the, more or less, the mainstream of industrial society on these matters, to a limited extent, in fact, but to some extent. Uh, and uh, that caused hysteria among the masters. Uh, so uh, you read the business press by 1936 or 37. Uh, again, these are things which in a really free society, everybody would study in elementary school, because they're really important, that these give the real framework of the society, in my view. Uh, the, uh, they were talking about uh, the hazard facing industrialists and the rising political power of the masses and how we must uh, do something to save ourselves or our way of life will be gone and we don't have a lot of time to do it. They started right away. Uh, by the late 30s, there was a big anti-labor campaign that had built up uh, it's, uh, with new techniques. You know, there, there was still use of force, but it was understood that that's not going to work the way it did. So there was a shift to uh, more propaganda, community organ. To, to the main idea was called the Johnst the Mohawk Valley formula, I guess. Is that what it was called? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, Mohawk Valley formula was designed by a lot of public relations hotshots around 36, 37, at the time of some of the steel strikes, uh, to uh, have a new, what they called scientific methods of strike breaking. We don't just come in, you know, with clubs and shoot people and smash their heads and that sort of thing. We do it the scientific way because the old way doesn't work anymore. And the scientific methods of strike breaking were, in fact, drawn from the public relations ideas of the kind that I talked about. Uh, the main idea was to uh, mobilize the community against the strikers and the union activists to present a picture which is by now so standard that you can hardly turn on the tube without seeing it because it's just poured out in, uh, you know, like streams ever since then. The basic idea is to present a picture of the world that looks kind of like this. Uh, there's, there's us, you know, kind of like big happy family in the community. Uh, the, um, you know, the honest workman going off every morning with his lunchbox, his loyal wife who's making the meals and taking care of the kids, the uh, hard-working executive who's toiling day and night in the interests of um, you know, his workers in the community, the friendly banker who's running around looking for people to lend money to and so on and so forth. That's us, you know, and we're all in harmony. Harmony was a big word. We're in harmony, we're all together, it's Americanism. You, you might take a look at that word Americanism. It's an unusual term. It's the kind of term that you only find in totalitarian societies, as far as I know. So like in the Soviet Union, 
anti-Sovietism was considered the gravest of all crimes, you know. And the Brazilian generals had some concept like that, anti-Brazilian. But try, say, uh, publishing a book on anti-Italianism and see what happens in the streets of Rome or Milan. I mean, people won't even bother laughing. It's a ludicrous idea. The idea of Italianism or, uh, you know, Norwayism or something like that, or these would just be objects of ridicule in societies that have some kind of residue of a democratic culture inside people's heads. I don't mean in the formal system. But in totalitarian societies, it is used. And as far as I know, the United States is the only free society that has such a concept. Maybe there's another one. Uh, if it, it, you might try it in places you know. But any, anyhow, Americanism is a, an anti-Americanism and un-Americanism and so on. These are concepts which go along with harmony and getting rid of those outsiders and all that kind of stuff. Uh, another part is simply to induce hatred, hatred and fear among people. So it's a diverse society. You, know, you go to Europe, most places are pretty uniform. This is a very diverse society. Uh, so it's easy. Uh, for, for propagandists, it's pretty easy to get people to you know, hate the guy next door because it looks a little different or one thing or another. And huge campaigns go on to uh, instigate uh, divisions among people. Uh, I don't have to tell you about this. It's all so familiar. You go on. But, but these are very natural techniques of social control. Now, if you can't control people by force, you have to control their minds. You have to control their attitudes, you have to, exactly like they say. Well, going back to the uh, Mohawk Valley formula, the idea was to move into a community, flood it with, pro where there's a strike going on, flood it with propaganda, you know, take over the media, the churches, the schools, everything, everywhere else, uh, pour in this propaganda about harmony and so on, the way I described it. And then there's those bad guys out there who are trying to disrupt our harmonious lives, you know, like that union organizer is probably a communist or an anarchist uh, anyway, and uh, uh, probably un-American, and he's trying to, you know, destroy all these wonderful things we have. And we got to band together and kick him out, you know. We have to defend our way of life against this. A lot of religion gets thrown in. Uh, remember that the United States is an extremely fundamentalist country. I mean, you look comparatively, comparative statistics, it, usually religious fundamentalism declines as industrialization goes up. It's pretty close correlation. The United States is off the chart. You know, it ranks with devastated peasant societies, probably more fundamentalist than Iran. Uh, there's all, uh, why this is so, is, I don't know. But I mean, in fact, it's a complicated question. But one factor is that it was certainly consciously fo uh, fomented by business leaders. That goes way back to the 19th century when they were supporting their favorite, I mean, John D. Rockefeller's favorite evangelist was, uh, a, a, who he poured a lot of money into, was some guy who said that people ought to have more enlightened ideas than labor agitation. That was one of his famous phrases. And the more enlightened ideas are, you know, go to church and listen to orders and, you know, do what they tell you and shut up. You know, that's the more enlightened idea. And it's a really interesting case because the Mohawk Valley was the model that was later used for strike breaking and destruction of the labor movement in the post-war period. So it's quite interesting to see what happened right there. Incidentally, I don't know any literature on this. Do you? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, these, these are untouchable topics, you know. And, and you can almost say that anything that's important, you know, it's going to matter for people's lives, it's got to be sort of off the agenda. And it sort of makes sense. You don't want people to know about it. Like, you don't want people to know the wrong kind of thing. After all, that makes sense. You know, it's like it's not a conspiracy or anything. It's just common sense if you have a certain degree of power and authority and privilege. You just don't want people to know things that might be harmful to them because they're really like children, remember. Uh, and we're the ones who have to make the decisions for them.